سلام من مریم آتش نوابی هستم Good evening and welcome to poll Afghanistan was once known as the orchard of Asia but its unique and vibrant ecosystem has been harmed by years of war and neglect while droughts and pollution threaten the health and well-being of Afghanistan's people Tonight, I'll speak with a young man who is part of a unique Muslim organization whose members work together to help preserve the environment. But first, I'll examine environmental challenges with two experts who have worked on these issues in Afghanistan. Joanne Trotter is Director of Programs at the Aga Khan Foundation, USA. She spent two and a half years in Afghanistan as the Head of External Relations and Grant Management. And Bruce Fryer is Director and Co-Founder of the Global Partnership for Afghanistan, an organization that works for the re-greening of Afghanistan. Thank you for joining me today. You're very welcome. Um, Afghanistan has actually been blessed with many natural wonders. Can you tell us about some of the plant and animal life that make the country unique? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the diversity of uh, the ecology and the ecosystems in Afghanistan is very, very impressive. Um, there are some very special animal species, particularly up um, in the northern areas of Badakhshan, which is one of the areas that the Aga Khan Development Network works in. Um, and that's home to Marco Polo sheep, to orioles, and to the snow leopard, which are all very uh, seriously endangered species and really a kind of huge um, national asset for Afghanistan, which I think needs very careful preservation. And do you think the population of these animals were also affected by the wars? Uh, very significantly. What once was a very kind of um, managed system for taking care of the environment has really been um, very severely challenged by the conflict. And a lot of systems have really broken down. And that has caused, I think, quite a lot of uh, vulnerability as the habitat that these animals uh, live in has really been um, degraded. Bruce, you've traveled to Afghanistan many times. Uh, you know the country faces a lot of environmental challenges. What are some of the other challenges that the country is facing? Being involved in the agricultural sector, uh, water is a, key, uh, is a key element. And the dynamics of water in Afghanistan um, are, are numerous. Uh, in, addition to, um, in addition to water, there is the um, the human environmental uh, capacity of the Afghan farmer who desperately wants to be a 21st century uh, farmer and yet because of the impact of the wars and, and, and the violence there finds himself or herself uh, just back in time. Uh, the main thrust is to get their farms back functioning and to get themselves uh, able to supply the amount of food they need to their families and therefore the environmental issues have a tendency to become a lower priority uh, it's a matter of it's a matter of priorities here also the, I think what plays a factor in this is the fact that we're dealing with uh, with farmers of whom the vast majority are illiterate and illiteracy plays a part in this well, the environment can obviously be an asset for a country. There's the whole concept of tourism, yes. which is relatively new. It combines tourism with environmental preservation. Joanne, can you tell yes. us about how this might work in Afghanistan and how that may benefit the country? Yeah. Um, I would say that probably in Afghanistan at the moment, there are two main regions where tourism um, is really possible. And that would be the Bamiyan region and also the Wakhan Corridor up in, in northern Badakhshan. We have um, an ecotourism program in the Bamiyan Valley. And that really is focused on a few key areas. Number one is making sure that any benefits from tourism accrue to local people, that they really benefit and can, can hold the, the resources with them. Um, we're also really looking at building up service providers, so tour guides, um, hoteliers, restaurants, to make sure that the service providers are there and in a kind of good enough quality to satisfy tourists. And we're also then establishing um, some associations and information centers for tourists to visit. And the potential I mean, the potential is enormous. And at the moment, I think the real, um, the, the audience for the tourism programs is obviously Afghans and then internationals currently living in Afghanistan. There are very few foreign visitors coming, coming for tourism at the moment. 
But have you seen an increase as these programs and services have been in place of foreigners wanting to go to Afghanistan because of its natural beauty? Absolutely, yes. And the other, there is, I think it's about one or two thousand uh, foreigners come to Afghanistan each year for tourism. The rest of the pool of tourists is really already in the country, internationals and, and locals alike. Bruce, you've traveled to Afghanistan during different periods of time. What would have been some of your memories of the country's natural resources? Well, we first went to Afghanistan, my wife and, and myself, in 1972. Um, at that time, the country was really at, at its height. Um, and uh, there are uh, a number of, of memorable um, uh, sites that, uh, that we visited, several that have been mentioned already. Certainly, I wouldn't want to leave out the Panjshir Valley, which is absolutely gorgeous. And it was, we, we just started working there uh, a couple of years ago. And I remarked on, at the time that I visited there, what a wonderful place for kayaking on the river, the potential for, for these things. I'm an avid skier. Skiing came to mind. There have been a number of articles not too long ago about, uh, about snow skiing in Afghanistan. There are, there's the potential of the Minaret Ajam, which is a, a natural, a wonderful natural site. Mm -hmm. um, the New York Times uh, just, I believe it was in December of this year, ran an article on uh, the Wakhan Valley uh, on the Tajikistan side. But of course, there's, there's the whole Pamir area up there, which from a hiker and trekker's point of view, is a very pretty safe area. I mean, nobody's nobody's up there. It's a wonderful opportunity for uh, for adventuresome um, uh, travelers. So there are a lot of challenges, but a lot of opportunity for ecotourism. Dobara, Bob, Bruce, more with Bruce Fryer and Joanne Trotter when we return. I'm back with Bruce Fryer and Joanne Trotter. We were talking about, you know, the diversity of animal and plant life in mm. Afghanistan. And you mentioned some species are endangered. Can you explain what that means? The, the habitats in which they live are under severe threat, both um, from human interaction, the human-animal interaction, but also really because of the, the depletion of the, um, the, the fodder, the food that they uh, use, but there's also uh, a significant problem with hunting and trophy hunting for some of those animals. So they have really, um, the populations have been damaged very considerably by that. And what can be done to help with that situation? Um, the point that we've started at, and this is, um, this is again up in the Wakhan corridor, is really to try and build up local people's understanding of the importance of those assets. So we've established kind of environmental protection committees within, uh, within communities in the Wakhan corridor to help them understand that these, that these species really are an asset for them. And that's been part of the ecotourism program that we've been promoting there because it's really one part, one reason why tourists would be attracted to the areas to see these animals in their natural habitat and to protect protect them in that habitat. And Bruce, some people might argue that, look, Afghanistan has a lot of problems, and we should really focus on the people, you know, the environment and animals. It's a secondary issue. How would you respond to that? Awareness, uh, education is by far the most um, important element here in, in helping to, to save this. And, um, and the Afghans are very cognizant of this. We had a team that went to Egypt on an agricultural mission and visited a lot of the museums and the pyramids and everything and came back and one of the questions I asked them, what did you learn? And they said, the Egyptians make so much money from the tourism that comes to, that comes to see their natural sites. We have to do the same thing here. We have wonderful natural sites. We have to capitalize on them. Um, moving to another topic, mm. air pollution. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past few years, as more and more people have moved into Kabul, mm. there's increasingly a problem with air pollution. Mm. Joanne, how is this problem created, and what effect does air pollution have on people's health? Um, okay, as, as, as far as my knowledge goes, it's really um, the dust from the unpaved roads is a big problem in Kabul. And then that is uh, very seriously compounded by the use of fuels, um, really there's a lot of burning of 
diesel in generators and wood and the smoke from from that hence ends up in the air and really it causes quite a lot of respiratory infections um, and and illnesses for people in Kabul. Are you aware of any efforts that are underway to help improve the air quality? Well certainly um, the increased power supply into Kabul will make a big difference as people can really rely on um, and it's hydroelectric power so it's it's relatively clean um, and as power supply into Kabul improves which it really has done over the last few years um, that can make a big difference but paving the roads uh, in Kabul would also would also be a big help. Now you're working with farmers to help them Correct. recreate their orchards, but would you encourage Afghans to uh, plant trees and other plants around them? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, uh, communi uh, uh, community natural development uh, uh, issues are, are crucial. Um, we recently uh, teamed up with a, with a gentleman in going into a neighborhood in Kabul where there were two empty lots that were littered and the neighborhood got together with this gentleman and our cooperation and turned them into parks where there are trees and bushes and shrubs and it's a community effort. Everyone in this community uh, pitches in monetarily to maintain this park. Um, Kabul in the 1970s when we were there was a city that was filled with trees. The road between Kabul and Mazari Sharif in the north, except in the heights of the Hindu Kush, were lined with trees growing up. The more trees we plant, the better it is for the, for the ecosystem of, uh, of the country. Uh, and to try and then wean the people away from the use of uh, of fossil fuels and other uh, and other fuels that help to contribute to the air pollution and electricity certainly is a key factor here once we get an adequate supply. Joanne, we discussed the issue of the ecotourism mm. and Afghanistan established its first national park yes. in Banda Amir. Indeed. Um, and Bruce was talking about how communities can actually create parks in their own areas. How should Afghans understand the value of having a national park system? It is, um, it's a phenomenal resource, really, both from an environmental perspective, the tourism perspective, and really the, the, the value of being able to come to somewhere. I mean, Bande Amir is a, an absolute jewel, a, internationally, a wonderful place, and have, protecting that environment is really, um, it's, a, it's a critical uh, element, I think, for Afghanistan, Afghans to have that sense of, um, pride and identity to some extent in their heritage and in their in their country. And are other countries using such systems for preserving the environment and promoting tourism? Absolutely. I mean, and America is a great example of this with with a wonderful range of, of national parks that protect very special areas. I know that in Afghanistan, you know, Bandi Amir is just the first. There are the, before the war, really, there was there was uh, plans to look up at the Pamirs and the Wakhan sure. Corridor for parks there, and we can only hope that that there are more areas that that get the protection they deserve. Bruce, you and your wife helped establish Global Partnership for Afghanistan. You're focusing on helping farmers and helping preserve the environment. What really inspired you as an American to do that? I think what inspired us to do it was uh, the fact that we had been in the country in the 70s when we saw it moving itself up. We witnessed over the years the degradation that took place there, uh, the yearning always to help and assist the Afghans. And um, I guess it boils down to the fact that when we returned to Afghanistan for the first time in June of 2003, and I looked at Kabul and I turned to Dana and I said, you know, if it wasn't for us knowing the Afghans and their tenacity and their determination, I would say to you, let's turn around, get on the next plane and put our efforts someplace else. But I said, you know, these people are going to dig themselves out of this and we're going to help them. This is a major, major effort that is going to produce great fruit. Um, and I think it will. It takes time and it takes patience. 
Well, Joanne and Bruce, thank you very much for participating and sharing uh, ideas and your work about uh, preserving the environment in Afghanistan and really sharing the message that Afghans themselves are part of the solution. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. I'll speak with a young man who works with fellow Muslims to help save the environment when we return. I'm here with Kevin Gordon Barrow, a member of D.C. Green Muslims, an organization that brings Muslims in the Washington, D.C. area together to work on projects that help the environment. Kevin, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Uh, D.C. Green Muslims is a unique organization. Can you describe how it got started? Yes, uh, D.C. Green Muslims was started, as uh, the name says, in D.C. Uh, when a bunch of friends just uh, decided to get together. Um, we all had uh, a very powerful and you know, loving relationship with uh, nature. And we said that we wanted to get together in a manner which connected our faith tradition with our passion for uh, nature and animals and creation. Is there a tradition in Islam for protecting the environment? Yeah, well, actually, it's it, it, quite, uh, quite a powerful one. So firstly, in the Quran, in several places, Allah refers to um, nature as being an ayah, as being an ayah to Allah. And so, in many respects, in the same way that we have ayahs in the bound Qur'an, i.e. the mushaf that we read, there are also ayahs in like the manifest universe. And each of those is potentially an avenue to being able to connect with the divine. And what about conserving resources? Uh, conserving resources is absolutely essential. Uh, there's actually a beautiful story about uh, making wudu. And the Prophet said, even if you were to make uh, wudu at the confluence of two rivers, don't use more than you need. And if you take this mentality into um, the way we use energy, the way we uh, use um, even electricity and other resources, um, that philosophy, I believe, applies. Um, can you think of any other verses in the Holy Quran or in the Hadith that refer to environmental issues? Yeah, um, so uh, another one is that Allah says that we have placed ayahs within you and in the horizons um, that you might get to know me. Um, another one dealing with animals specifically and our need to take care of them and to respect them is that you know, there's not a creature on the earth or um, that flies with two wings, but that I've created them with, as communities like you. And so really the reflection and doing dhikr um, on animals, on the horizon, on the ayahs that are completely manifest in this earth are um, things that we should not uh, overlook. So what some of us may think, you know, environmental issues that something new has actually been around for thousands of years. 100 percent. Like even if you look at Mecca, Mecca was one, actually the first environmental sanctuary in the sense that within the precincts of Mecca, um, on you know, a prophetic uh, order, like you weren't allowed to kill anything. And so it was a notion that every bit of nature from a tree to an animal was protected within its precincts. What kind of projects does DC Green Muslims, you know, partake in here in Washington, DC? Actually, a lot of our projects are um, dealing with um, environmental social justice. So like working in poor communities to um, beautify, to um, teach people about, you know, uh, about and just like the nature around them that they might respect it, as well as um, interfaith uh, projects where we get together with, uh, you know, um, other religious traditions, such as Christians, Jews, Hindus, as well as people that are coming from an agnostic tradition and we clean up rivers, we plant trees, we um, go on hikes and just, you know, marvel at the splendor of God's creation. And how do you feel when you partake in those activities that are interfaith? What's amazing is that, you know, the Quran speaks about prophets from Adam straight through to our prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it the constantly reminds us of that reiteration of the divine message, that there's only been one kitab. And what's amazing is that when we speak to our brothers and sisters from other faith traditions, we realize that they are not too dissimilar from ourselves. And actually, when it comes to the level of principle, when it comes to the level of that which is ma'roof, that which is known from within, um, we see that we're almost identical. Do you find that some of them are surprised that the Holy Quran or Hadith may have so many, you know, so, so much support for environmental protection? SubhanAllah, it's amazing because time after time, you see just like people's eyes become very wide and they're surprised. That's in the Quran and uh, when, and it actually inspires many people to actually interact with the Quran because unfortunately, what most people know is, uh, you know, from the media or something which uh, doesn't actually reflect 
having actually looked at divine text or having looked at Islam in depth. And this is a beautiful way of sharing our tradition with other communities. And um, what, are there any other groups like DC Green Muslims in other cities in the US? DC is a very transient pop, has a very transient population. And many times when uh, people have lived here for one year, a few months, go out back to their home community, they try to start something very similar. It might be good, you know, just five people that decide, you know, look, in our masjid, we see people making wudu, wasting water, we see people that don't recycle, we see people that litter and don't take care of the earth, and they say, let's do something here in our own community. So it, the worship is not the person praying to God, but it's also taking care of things around them. Indeed, um, in the Quran, like you know, it invites us to have like a holistic perspective, and ibadah salihin. You know, it, like our actions are you know are not only our our actual ritual prayers and fasting, but the way we interact with others, and indeed the way we interact with the universe. And your group has something that you practice called eco halal. Eco what does halal. that mean? So right now, if you look at your know, halal, the way that it's practiced in many places, it just means that the animal has been killed, you know, in a manner which is consistent with uh, with with, uh, the, with halal. But what we look at is like halal being from the beginning of an animal's life to the end. You know, that notion that. Um, everything must be taken into account. Or um, eco halal in the way that we um, dress, you know, that our, our clothes haven't been uh, you know, part of it, like an exploitative process in terms of their creation. So really trying to take halal back to the prophetic principles. Instead of looking at models, extract what are the principles here. Um, is your group reaching out to the Muslim community and educating Muslims about environmental issues? Indeed. Um, you know, what, what's amazing is that we have uh, you know, the, these massive dinners that are sometimes attended by hundreds of people that bring together like different masajid, you know, people that are Sunni with people who are Shia, people from Afghanistan with people who are from China and Africa. And what's amazing is that when we get together, it's just like this very powerful confluence and you know as is said in the Quran you know we've created you in many colors and in many nations with many languages that you might get to know each other and so it's just like a beautiful tapestry that comes together and do you find that when you raise these issues and you present halal in a different way that that ends up relating to differences in actions from people who listen to that 100% when you begin to think about you know say the food that you put into your system and you reinvent um, that context of halal and take it back to the principle, it then gets um, your interaction with all of the other principles that Islam has. Salah it becomes not just action in terms of bowing and putting your head on the ground, but rather you really think about its origin, wasala, to connect, to connect with the divine. And so everything becomes more real and, um, and you become more conscious of the very moment. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, for your time and sharing the really interesting work of DC Green Muslims. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bota Shakur as Bruce Fryer. My Joanne thanks Trotter, to Bruce Fryer, Joanne Trotter, and Kevin Gordon Barrow. We'd love to hear what you think about this or any other poll program. Just go online to aamtv.tv or visit us at tolo.tv. See you next week for another edition of Pull.